Correct. If, if all things are in place, to her question, how long does it take to probate to get things moving? If there's no issues, how long does that take? So, um, I mean, you can have from the time that somebody passes away to the time that you actually have a will probated and you have somebody authorized, that can be as short as two weeks. That can happen fairly quickly. Okay. I mean, you can try it yourself if you want to. You can, I, be, I believe, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the law library may have materials on probate that you can purchase there. If you are trying to do a family member will be we have two medicated self guided packets. I probably won't use it, but I just I'm just trying to understand the process. It's still you can still have a lawyer to get it to probate. Have a professional help shepherd you through the process. Okay. Uh, there's a red tape because there's a lot of red tape involved too. Yeah. You don't want to get caught the person that's behind, you don't want them to get caught up in all the weeds and stuff. Yeah, but if there's, yeah, again, if there's something that I could emphasize it again, is it's this, it's this notion that because, because I have a will, I don't have to do probate, and that couldn't be further from the truth. The whole point of having the will is so that you can, it's the benefit of being able to take it to the court to get it probated so that somebody can be put in charge of your estate and can carry out what your will says. Exactly, exactly. Please, Amy. So these letters testamentary that Amy mentions, right? These are the documents that the court issues. It's going to be issued by the, the clerk's office in the court that, um, that are basically, it's, it's your evidence if you're the person in charge of the estate that you're in charge. It's called letters testamentary. Um, if it's an intestate estate, so if somebody died without a will, you're getting letters of administration. Letters testamentary if there's a will, letters of administration if there's not a will. In Pierce County, they're issued on light blue pieces of paper. They're stamped by the clerk of the court, and they are your ticket to be able to talk to third parties so that they'll acknowledge your authority to do what needs to be done for the decedent's estate. Okay. So if I die, for a minute. You're never going to die, Louis. That's right. Uh, the will and the will will be, let's say, my my wife. So she'll go to the court, mm -hmm. right? To prove that she's entitled, she's the administrator of the entire company. So the entire sort to take care of everything. Correct. Again, that's your starting point. Now, remember, you and your wife, for your situation, there may be ways around that. Maybe the two of you decide that for your situation, the community property agreement is going to work, and you can use the community property agreement to say everything we own, we own together, and when the first of us dies, it's all going to the survivor, right. and then you can use that community property agreement to leapfrog probate when the first of you dies. It's the first time. When the first, but, but, the, but when the second dies, and there's no spouse to pass property to, probate okay right and that's where you know again we'll so we'll pick on your wife because she's not here you outlive her right and, and then yeah let's run with the example you outlive her you pass away you don't remarry at that point in time you know you have children one of your kids presumably is going to be who you've named to be in charge of your estate that child is going to have to take your will to the court to get it probated to get the court to authorize him or her to be in charge of your estate and issue letters testamentary so they can provide those letters testamentary to the banks, the real estate agents, the title companies. The... So all you're doing is a safeguard for them. Correct. So they, they don't have to be tied up in probate. 
Well, so again, I, I would I would encourage us not to think of things being tied up in probate because that makes probate seem like it's the exception to the rule. Probate is the rule. The whole point is to go through the probate process. So there's a legal probate administration. Probate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Again, assume that assume that at some point probate is going to make an appearance in your afterlife when you don't care about it, but your kids will do. Right. You can order as many as you want. So, uh, Five dollars for letters test for each letters testamentary through the clerk of the court. Huh? And again, if you have if you're working with a lawyer, your lawyer's office almost always will order those for you. Kind of in the same way that when you're working with a funeral home, the funeral home is going to order death certificates for you. It's going to be that kind of a, an arrangement. Um, okay. This has been fun. I feel like I need to do like a quick dash though, hundred yard dash through like all the other stuff we haven't talked about yet. Um, okay. So again, you can see in the materials, I go into some more detail about kind of the, the, the process of getting things up and running, submitting the will. If there is one, um, if there's not a will, how do you, what do you do at that point? Cause you still need to go in to get somebody put in charge of the estate. And I've provided some sample documents at the end of the materials that you can look at just so you have an idea of like, what do these court documents actually look like? You know, when I'm, when I'm filing these with the court, right? Um, but just so that I can say that I walked it toward the, to the end, <laughs> I'm gonna go through really quickly some of the steps that are involved in probate. And then again, if we wanna open it back up for some questions, we can do that. So, um, so you've gone, to the, you've gone through the process of getting somebody appointed to be in charge of the estate. You've gotten the letters of administration uh, or, the, or the letters testamentary, depending on whether the person had a will or not. Then what do you do, right? At that point in time, um, there's going to be several different things that are going on. Number one, you have to address the debts of the deceased person. Did they owe money? Are there claims out there that people might have against them, right? And there's a process that's an optional process, but generally recommended that it be done, that the personal representative can do to get those debts addressed, right? Usually that, and that involves publishing a notice with a legal newspaper for three weeks, and then sending out individual copies of those notices to any known creditors so that they have a period of time to, to get back and file a claim against the deceased person's estate. And if they don't do it within these time limits, then they're gone, right? So there is that process of addressing the, the deceased, the decedent's debts and claims. Um, there's also, um, you know, one of the major things that needs to happen is that an estate inventory has to be put together. What all are we dealing with? What did that person leave behind? You know, what real estate properties do we have? Or what bank accounts were there? Were there investment accounts? Are these are there life insurance policies? Um, were their business interests? What all are we working with? And so one of the big jobs of the personal representative is to put that inventory together and to also get date of death values for those assets. Because it's those date of death values that among other things are going to control whether you have to pay estate taxes. What was the overall value of the estate when that person died? Is it below or above that estate tax limit? Right, so you have to get those data death values for uh, for some assets. That's pretty easy to get. So if we're talking about financial accounts, it's uh, usually just a request to that financial institution, like, "Hey, so and so's passed away. I'm in charge of the estate. Can you please give me the data death values for accounts X, Y, and Z?" Right. For others, it can be a little bit more difficult. Like with real estate, um, if you are going to sell the property pretty soon, then you can rely on the market value that you're going to get as the sale price for the data death value. But if it's going to be a little bit longer, you might need to get an appraisal. Or if you don't want to pay for an appraisal, sometimes you can get away with doing like a comparative market analysis by a real estate agent just to kind of give you a figure for, okay, what was the house worth when the person passed away? So creating that inventory is a big, is a big part of the probate process, just knowing what all are we working with? What are these assets that are going to be distributed out to the beneficiaries um, as we get closer to the end? Um, see. You're going to want to set up a, um, 
a bank account, at least one bank account for the estate. So the estate is, is treated as its own separate entity for purposes of federal taxes. So you have to get an EIN, an employee, employee, employer identifier number for the estate. And that's, what's, that's the tax number that's gonna be associated with a, a bank account for the estate. Yes, Pamela. Okay. So the lawyer may or may not help getting the tax number, but typically the bank account itself is going to be set up by the person who's in charge of the estate. Well, see, I'm in charge. <laughs> I'm are you the one? Are you the one in charge of the estate? I'm the I'm oh, the oh, even yeah. more fun. Okay, yeah. fun twist. Asking these questions because if they make okay, okay, I got to be careful with how I think because I don't want to come across that I'm accusing anyone or anything like that. All I need to do is state the facts, right? So stating the facts are, you were told that, because there's a lot of us involved, there's mm -hmm. like 32. Oh my goodness. I'll take that back. 32? Seven pieces of property. Wow, okay. 32 okay. relatives, um, first cousins, we're all first cousins. Mm -hmm. And, um, we were told by our attorney who is a holding attorney that they would have a trust account set up for us. Had I known this before, then we wouldn't allow them to do that. Mm -hmm. Because they are sorry. Here I go again. I have to stop doing that. So I'm, I'm really paying attention to what I'm saying and what I'm, you know, I want, I'm here to get this. Uh, I have seen I have seen uh, law offices that will use the trust account, uh, their internal trust account for their clients to manage assets for the estate. I don't do that myself. Okay. I would much prefer that my clients set up an estate account themselves and manage it. Okay. Because number one, that's a DIY thing that yeah. the personal representative can do. Yeah. Number two, the less that I have to touch your money, right. the better for me, right? right? Yeah. I don't wanna be responsible for that. I wanna hold on to as little trust money as I have to. Okay. And so I'd much prefer that you're the one managing it and that you're the one setting up the account. And again, too, this kind of gets into some of the other aspects of the probate administration is depending on what assets you have, you might wanna have a smaller bank account just for kind of day-to-day -day or monthly expenses for the estate. But if there's Significantly more, you may want to open up one or more investment accounts where you have conservative investments for the estate properties and assets before they're any before they get transferred to the beneficiary. So you, there may be multiple accounts under that estate tax number that gets set up so that you can hold the various assets of the estate 